All right, good afternoon and welcome everyone to CRC in the studio. Uh, we're really excited to be here again for one of our weekly installments of our in-studio series. This is a new series that we started this year in response to the COVID-19 crisis and uh, our digital learning environment, something that we want to do to supplement our instruction with the students here at Kasumnas River College. And so uh, we thank you for joining us today. And of course, thank you for joining us in previous weeks. Uh, today, I'm really excited to bring someone on who's a, a really special artist and a friend, uh, Brian Carter, the percussionist, multi-instrumentalist, composer, singer, and all around great guy. Welcome, Brian Carter. Good morning. Good morning, man. How you doing? <laughs> Good. I suppose it's afternoon where you are, though. Is that right? Just around uh, 3 p.m. I see. Are you coming to us uh, come from New York? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm right in the center of Manhattan. Very cool. They're, uh, Very they're cool. shooting a movie outside of my apartment right now. So there's like, if you hear yelling or if you hear, <laughs> for some reason, like an explosion going off, everything's okay. <laughs> they're just... Uh, they, I guess they're making some Hollywood magic. So. All right. I love it. I love it, you know. That's part of the magic of being in New York, of course. You get to uh, be in the center of all of it. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, man, again, it's really great to see you. I'm trying to remember the last time I saw you was probably in Savannah, Georgia. Was that right? Yeah, About yeah, a year Savannah. ago. Savannah Music Festival. Yeah. Yeah. And you were a clinician there. You were a guest artist and working with our students there. Um, and one of the things that always struck me about you is that you're such a such a magnetic personality. You're really great with students and, uh, and, a, and a great entertainer. And so when we were putting the series together and they're asking, who do you want to bring on? I thought of you instantly for so many different reasons, but, um, but those being a few of them. So for those of um, you watching out there who are not familiar with Brian and Brian's music, I'm going to play a little something for you all to give you a little taste of who he is. And then uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about yourself, Brian, when we're done. Um, so this is a clip of you from a few years ago leading a group playing the music of ray charles uh, do you remember this show yeah at dizzy's right at dizzy's yeah exactly i think marquise hill was on this gig and uh and a few other cats that we might be familiar with but um i think this is a great clip because it kind of demonstrates your 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 range so i want to show this to everybody and you get a sense of what brian is is all about here we go I don't know if you guys know, but something that we like to do is we like to mess around. One, two, uh, 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 uh.
Yeah, man. God, that's so much fun. Yeah, you're taking me back a few years, man. <laughs> <laughs> a few years now. That was uh, 2000, 2016, I think, right? Something like that. What? 2015 or 16? Or... 15 yeah. or 16, yeah. Man, I mean, it just looks like you have so much fun on stage and, you know, you're really connecting with your audience and uh, obviously you do a lot of things, right? You're, you're a drummer and when you weren't drumming, Marquise was sitting in and you were singing, man. And I didn't know you were a singer and your most recent release, you're singing on that as well. Um, so I, I want to touch on those topics today, you know, how we, how we kind of create our careers and how we evolve and we change, right? Because this whole series that we're doing in the studio is about content creation and career development. So maybe we kind of take a few steps back and talk about where you started, how you got uh, started in music. Yeah, so um, the way that I actually know you is through my, my father, who's a jazz educator and a musician. Um, so I, I, I grew up literally surrounded by the music. Um, my dad was a high school band director um, until I was about four or five years old. And I basically lived in that band room uh, being surrounded uh, by all the instruments. And when I wasn't in that band room, I was at church, also being surrounded by all that, you know, all the instruments. And that was just like a, a very normal thing to uh, be a multi-instrumentalist, to, to sing. Everyone in my family sings. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a part of like the African-American black church. Everyone sings, everyone sings in the choir. Like if you like music and you're a kid then you play organ and then you play piano and then you play you know i yeah <laughs> I, was I remember being a little kid my parents were out of town and my grandmother was with us and uh you know she just pinches me and she's like honey go give this go give this note to the pastor and i'm like yes ma'am you know and i give the note to the pastor and he opens it up and he goes oh wonderful young brother brian is gonna bless us with the song on the organ and i look at her and i'm like <laughs> But grandma, I don't know how to play organ. And she's like, it's all right, baby. Jesus will lead you. And I'm like, no, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> you know, that's kind of like the mindset. It's like, everyone was like um, and I was, I was playing violin when I was a kid and took Suzuki. And, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I just grew up in a household that was extremely eclectic. We went to see the orchestra. We, we of course, we're around jazz all the time, gospel music. You know, I have older brothers. I heard the pop music and R&B music of the 90s and early 2000s, you know? Mm -hmm. So I have all of that as well, so. A lot of different influences, you know? And I think this is kind of a hallmark of people of, of our generation. You know, I, I think I'm only a, a bit older than you are, but, um, but I think we're, we're part of the same kind of generation where we have a lot of these you know, pop music influences and we're kind of bringing a lot of different things to the table in our careers. And I think, again, you're a great example of that, um, not only in your approach to the many different instruments that you play, but to the music that you create yourself. So we were just listening to some uh, Ray Charles uh, and you know we had a special connection to that. Let the Good Times Roll was a tune we would always close with. Your dad would always call yeah. that tune at the end of every Northern Illinois University Jazz Ensemble concert and he would sing it, you know, he would sing. And uh, I, I just love that that tradition being carried on and that music is so infectious and it's kind of, you know, an example of one of the great crossover artists in music history, right? Where Ray Charles is bringing together so many different influences um, and uh, being so successful at it in, uh, in the world of music. Um, What's special about Ray is that he, I mean, one, he was kind of ostracized by the church for, you know, mixing hymns with secular music. So there's that aspect of it. Um, but then also, you know, his his recordings playing jazz music, you know, and, and then, you know, when he went over to the larger label, like the albums he was making, uh, you know, with orchestras and the Ray Charles singers and, you know, um, you know, we, we know like Georgia on my mind and, and, you know, this kind of like massive production. So there was that side of it too. And then uh, one of my favorite albums is Modern Sounds in Country and Western Music, you yeah. know, volume one and two, you know, so he was making like country albums and for, especially at that time for a, a black artist to one cross over to country music and, and, you know, also play jazz and make all these recordings. It was extremely, uh, it was unheard of, you know, and, and the type of deals he was being offered were unheard of because he was able to reach so many 
uh, diff- so many different types of people, you know. Do you think that uh, from a personal perspective and maybe from a historical sp- perspective of someone like Ray as well, that that you and, and people like Ray would do things like this naturally? Or do you think it's a conscious decision as you are kind of going through your career and developing kind of uh, plans for success and trying to reach a, a wider audience and, and increase your success in the field? Do you think that these are conscious decisions or just things that are inherent to who you are? Like, yeah, of course, I'm going to play some country music and bring in elements of blues and pop music and, and bring that all together because that's who I am. Or is it a little more calculated? No, you know, for me, I think it's different for everyone. Hmm. And, and again, going back to the way I grew up, for me, I think, you know, I I was put through like a very uh, strict and traditional education, especially, you know, attending Juilliard. It was like you walk in the door and the handcuffs are on, you know, yeah, welcome yeah. to jail yard, as we called it, you know. <laughs> Is that true? Jail yard? <laughs> jail yard. Um, oh, man. Yeah, you know, Ju- Juilliard, we, we didn't even have any amps, like, in the building, from what I recall, you know, it was like, you didn't, you didn't play anything else, you did what you were there to do, you know, it was a very serious education. And I feel like the older I get, the more comfortable I become with just, like, doing what I want to do, mm-hmm. um, and kind of moving away from, you know, conserved, institutionalized music, you sure. know, an institutionalized mentality like the way that you're supposed to dress the way that you're you're supposed to speak and and you know the way that you're supposed to address an audience and mm. um for me it can feel a bit stuffy at time at times you know the reason i started this band specifically is because i was tired of of uh playing a bunch of venues where i would look out into the audience and one it was half full and the people who were there were just like old gray-haired white people yeah, <laughs> like certainly this music has to be more accessible than that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're absolutely right about that, and that's something that I see you know, or saw in your dad as well. And I start to realize that that's uh, you know so much so much more important than than what we play sometimes is who we play for and how we kind of reach them in in so many ways. And I think that you're you're part of this this kind of younger generation of, of a few few individuals specifically you and a group like sammy miller and the congregation that are just kind of like bringing the fun back to jazz you know what i mean there's maybe a period where things were a little academic and a little intellectual and um we kind of alienate our audiences that way don't we but in all your performances and the things we're going to hear from you today it's it's all about engagement and kind of bringing people in together like um like you would experience in a church service right it's a community it's communion together um, yeah, I mean, and so the, Sammy sorry. and I both went, in, went through that same kind of a program at different times. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I know that when Sammy was at Juilliard, he was feeling the same way. He was kind of like, yeah. all right. <laughs> <laughs> so all to be clear, though, you went to Juilliard for 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 percussion or composition? Uh, I went for, for drums. You went for I drums. Drum. All, right. all right. But I... I lied to uh, get in the, the orchestration classes. I see. All right. Because was, that was one of my questions. I was like, man, I had no idea you had such an interest in orchestration and composition. And here you are. That's That has become your, your main thing, really. So how did that how did that pivot or that, that change happen? Um, it was something that I was really interested in going into to Juilliard. I, I love okay. the orchestra. Mm. You know, and I didn't know anything about it, <laughs> but I was surrounded by really amazing musicians and uh, and instrumentalists and composers and arrangers. So it was like I had this opportunity to like pull four friends in our room and be like, "Yo, I just ordered a pizza." And they're like, "Oh, cool." And I'm like, "And while we're waiting, you know, how about you just pull out your instrument and you know, <laughs> let's read the three chords that I wrote?" And they're like, uh, "You know." Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it, I audited uh, Rich Tarosa. If you don't know Rich, he's an amazing, um, amazing orchestrator and composer and arranger. I think he's head of the program at North Texas right now. Um, but I, I audited his class my freshman year, his like master's class because we weren't, we weren't supposed to do that either. Um, and then I, I took orchestration one and two, advanced orchestration, and. Um, going into the class they were like are you 
the composition major? And I was like, uh, no. I know if I told, I knew if I told them I was a jazz musician, there'd be a, it'd be a, an instant no. I was, <laughs> uh, no, I'm a, a percussion major, but I, I I take composition lessons. They were like, oh okay, and no one no one checked it. And then I think like a couple of weeks in, the t- teacher Schaefer Mahoney was like, oh, you're always on tour. This doesn't check out. And then, <laughs> I it's too late. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know, it's funny because you're kind of alluding to some of the issues that, you know, musicians have, like, you know, if you're in the music industry, if you're studying music, you kind of, you kind of get a sense of these, these clicks and these vibes that we have in the music industry. It's not just, you know, musicians as a, as a monolithic group of, of individuals, there are <clears throat> some lines that are being drawn. And, you know, as someone like you is a person who likes to blur the lines, who likes to blend the communities and move amongst these communities fluidly and not be judged by the fact that, yeah, I'm okay. I'm a, I'm a jazz drummer, but Hey, I like the orchestra too. And I might have something to offer in that, you know, in that musical Avenue or that the venue. Um, so you alluded to a band earlier that you started, uh, you're alluding to the Young Swangers, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my crew. <laughs> the crew. So can we listen to something then, as long as we're talking about orchestra and the Young Swangers and everything, let's um, listen to You'll Never Walk Alone from the Young Swangers Orchestra. Um, this was a feature that you guys did at Jazz at Pride, and this was an event that you hosted, is that correct? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, uh, village we can talk about it after for sure okay here we go everyone enjoy you'll never walk alone by brian carter and the young swingers orchestra
Wow. <laughs> wow, chills. I think some people in the chat here are saying the same thing. Yeah, chills. Wow, what an incredibly powerful performance, man. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, that was uh, Jay Horde, um, who's a tremendous uh, vocalist here in New York City, as you all heard, um, in the orchestra. And uh, one of my favorite compositions from Rodgers and Hammerstein from a musical called Carousel. So, mm. yeah. So can you talk to us a little bit about that event? Because it seems like something you're really involved in is something you started uh, was it last year or the year before? Uh, yeah, this I guess two summers now because this summer everything was locked down. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were, so I'm a member of the LGBTQ community um, and we were having the first World Pride here in, I believe in the United States, the first World Pride. It was the uh, 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots. Um, if you aren't familiar with Stonewall, which everyone should be because it should be taught in U.S. history in every school in America, but for some reason it's not. Um, there was uh, basically a, a, a night where uh, the police in New York City came into a, a bar and they began to raid the bar and they would do this regularly. They would come in and they would see queer people and they would arrest them and beat them and, you know, uh, it was a really horrible time. Uh, in our in our history um and this particular night you know everyone inside of the venue started to fight back and uh yeah there was kind of like days and days of of unrest all around new york city uh from people within the queer community um and it began as like kind of like this huge march from from uptown to downtown you know people taking the streets um, all the way down to City Hall, demanding to be treated with respect. And then that next year, um, they did it again um, in remembrance of what had happened the year before. And that mm -hmm. was kind of like the first Pride Parade. And so that's where, that's where Pride started. So it was the 50th anniversary. Um, New York City was absolutely crazy for the entire month of June. Um, there are people everywhere. Um, but I, I just thought it was super strange that there were no jazz events. You know, jazz is supposed to be the music of freedom, and there's there was nothing. Wow! Um, yeah, we're gonna put together a, a pride show, <laughs> and For sure. many hours later, there that's what happened. <laughs> that's what an incredible you know spark of imagination and and um, and then creativity to actually put that that thought into motion because you're absolutely right, like. Even in our last week's discussion for my jazz history course, we've been talking about jazz and the civil rights, you know, its place in that movement. Um, right. And the words that Dr. Martin Luther King would speak about jazz and how it's the perfect soundtrack for, for this movement and for the spirit of, of democracy and democratic values and, and, and human values, you know, um, that's, that's just incredible. So this is a, kind of your baby then, this is something you've taken on and you're gonna try to do it again and again and again, yeah? Yeah, we were hoping to do it uh, again this this past summer during Pride Month, but mm -hmm. you know, we have old COVID. Yeah, <laughs> weird, ugly head. So <laughs> hopefully next year we'll be back. Yeah, I you know I do want to talk a little bit about that. How your career has changed, you know, since COVID. I, I have a sense that maybe it hasn't changed as much as probably some other people because you're already doing so much engagement in a virtual and online environment, but. Um, but before we get too far off topic, I did want to ask you about, you know, this idea of activism because um, your most recent release is called Dear Blue and it's um, kind of brings together maybe these elements of the experiences of people in the LGBT community, the people um, uh, of color in, in our country and police brutality and those kinds of things. Do you see your role as a musician or a composer as one of, as an activist or is this something you kind of um, are doing as a byproduct of, of your response to things that are happening around you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I come from uh, a family of activists that's that's one. You know, my, my dad was the first person to integrate his high school in South Georgia, you know, um, and, you know, ended up graduated valedictorian. And, you know, my grandparents were activists. My grandmother on my mom's side was, a poll watcher and you know it was secret underground like black panthers like 
mm-hmm. you know, feeding the homeless, getting kids to school, you know, that was, I mean, I, the Black Panthers on television now, they're like these, you know, crazy radical, I mean, back then they were the black equivalent of the Salvation Army, basically. Um, sure. But yeah, you know, I, I didn't even really realize these things until I was an adult, until I would talk to other people and they would tell me stories about my grandparents. Um, you know, I think it was four years ago when Hillary Clinton was, was running for president. Um, you know, then he was the current vice president, Joe Biden, you know, he invited my grandmother to introduce him. <laughs> you know, it was like, because she was this huge deal in the, in, you know, St. Louis civil rights. Wow. Uh, in the civil rights era. So I, I just, I heard the stories as a kid, but it just kind of went over my head because it was my grandmother. But you know, as an adult, I kind of realized uh, how influential they were. So I think that's naturally something that's just like a part of me. Um, and then, you know, beyond, I mean, being a musician is a massive part of, of my identity. Um, but then there's you know, the other the other part of it, which is like, one, I'm a, I'm a person of color. I'm a, I'm a young black male. Um, and I, I grew up in the Midwest. So unfortunately, you know, I experienced all sorts of of <laughs> of, of racism and, and bigotry, um, and then beyond that, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a queer person, so there's you know there's that as well. It, yeah, it can it can yeah. be tough, you know. Um, when we, when we beginning a conversation about intersectionality, you know, uh, it, it gets very real, so. I think as a young musician, as someone who loved jazz, one, I I didn't see anyone playing jazz who shared my identity. I didn't know any any queer people who played jazz growing up, mm. you know? I see, um, I see. And that is a problem for me. So mm. another huge reason why we, we started Jazz at Pride um, is to to lead by example, to help kids know that it gets better. I mean, you know, the more that I'm, I'm, I'm reaching out and I'm, I'm putting resources out there, like, you know, I do, I'm doing my best not to be a, a therapist because I'm not a therapist, but just like yeah. the of kids, the amount of adults, the amount of people who reach out to me and, and tell me their story and they're struggling with coming out or they're trying to figure out their identity, you know, and just being like, well, thank you. You know, I, I can I see now that this is possible. Mm. You know, I, there, there are you know people like Alfonso Horn and, and and Michael Winzo and you know we're we're out here together, you know, trying to to pave a way and make a way. Mm. Yeah. Thanks for that. that. This is a huge conversation, um, not only uh, you know in our nation, but but on our campus. It's been something that's really been uh, consuming our campus and. Um, in, in a good way, we're having these conversations about, you know, representation, intersectionality, decolonizing our curriculums, um, making sure that all are welcome into our programs. And um, I'm glad you're speaking to those points. Um, man, yeah, a lot to digest there. You know, when you're a public figure, I suppose you, you kind of get used to this idea that you have to be um, so many things to so many different people, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that video we just watched, you know, it was, it was posted on uh, Zildjian. I'm a Zildjian artist, symbol company. Um, they posted it on their page, and like the comments were horrendous. You know, oh. just like really horrible, horrible comments directed at me and Jay Horde. And then you know, after that, like death threats, and you know, I had to call like my label and be like, "Man, can you guys track this person who said they're gonna come to my house and you know shoot me?" Like, oh no, <laughs> terrifying. You know, yeah. Um, there's a, there's just a lot of work to do and, they, and there's two sides of that, you know, there's the people that you inspire and then there's the people who, you know, unfortunately in their, in their own walk, whatever they're dealing with, they want to go that route with it. They want to go that direction. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and dear blue, you know, that came about after, you know, I was at a protest. I think at this point I had been to like 15, 16 protests and, in New York City, um, and this was ironically by far the most calm, <laughs> like chill. Everyone's just like in the park, 
literally mm-hmm. singing and, and people had their instruments out. It was very, very chill. You know, they, they had the, the curfew instated here in New York City. And I went to the grocery store. I picked up some food for dinner and I was walking home. There was a group of police officers and, you know, the night before I, I saw a group of police officers and I like crossed the street and like walked around the block because I didn't even want to deal with it. Mm. I was like, it's daylight out. There's so many people around. This is ridiculous, you know. So like I, I walked by and, you know, I had my sign and my sign said like something like, uh, uh, if you love, love or love black people the way that you love black music. That's what it was. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, one of the cops was like, <clears throat> said something and I just like turned around and I was like, hey man, I'm, I'm not your enemy. I don't want you to be my enemy. Like, we just want to make it just want to make it home to our families at the end of the day, just like you want to make it home to yours. You know, I, I think that we, we share the same, a lot of the same thoughts and we, you know, I was trying to be genuine and, 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 and peaceful and nice and I was in a good place. And, you know, as I turn around and walk away, like one of the cops pushes me and like I land right on my, my knee and, you know, people are just, people walking are just like, oh my God, like my groceries are rolling down the street. <laughs> And uh, I see like a group of kids and like they start running towards me and I'm like, if you guys come over here, you're, you're going to get knocked out. So like just mm. stay back there. I pick my stuff up and I like kind of limp home and yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> um, that inspired Dear Blue. Uh, it gave me the idea because I, one, I was really angry and I was embarrassed and I had all these feelings. Um, that I need to get out, but I didn't want to write a song about anger, you know, and frustration. It's mm-hmm. like if I were to have a conversation with that police officer who assaulted me, I'd want to do so in a productive way, and I'd want to very mm-hmm. calmly like ask him what were what were his motivations? Like, was it worth it? Did he feel better afterwards? You know, so that's fantastic. I I, mean, I love that perspective too because I think a lot of the musical responses that we've had. Um, from you know so many different artists whether in the pop realm or or otherwise haven't really reflected that view or that perspective um entirely um i'm sorry to hear that happen and um yeah i remember when you released this uh just listening to it just feeling so um i don't know so sorry and um so moved and the music is just so beautiful as well um and so i think we should play it is that all right yeah, this is a, a recording, a second recording you did, but there's a, a recording that you have available on Apple Music and a few other places. Where can people find your music, by the way? Uh, yeah, uh, you can find it on Spotify, Apple Music, uh, Tidal, wherever, whatever your preference. Wherever it is. All right. Um, so this is a version, a live at home version, right? Right. We, we did for an organization called Lift Every Vote. Okay. Um, so we just all recorded kind of like a stripped down acoustic version from home. Great, here we go. This is Dear Blue. Dear Blue, it's me, don't want to fight, please read. I thought I'd write to you and share my point of view. No, don't you cry for me. Please wipe your eyes and see my blackness clearly. No, I never caused any pain or harm. To you, deep blue. I see your light, I know the drill. My eye is out, hands on the wheel for you, deep Think of all the 
It's gone because of you. Because of you, dear blue. Because of you, dear blue. I'm here to reprimand your fear in the Again, beautiful, just gorgeous, gorgeous, really powerful music. Thanks, man. There are no words. There are no words. What could I say? <laughs> it's just, it's gorgeous, and you're, you're, it's so heartfelt, you know. And it's something that I always talk about with with students. Like you, when you know that something's authentic, it's like it's hard to pinpoint exactly what it is, but you feel it. You know, you hear it. <laughs> There's like a real experience there, um, and it comes through the speakers, right? It comes through the recording. You can tell when somebody's really. Um, lift what they're what they're speaking about or or what they're playing on their instruments you know um so i guess i do have a few other questions about you again we're kind of, kind of talking about you know your career and how it's developed how, how has your career changed especially given the impact of this particular year uh, with so much going on in the social fabric of the nation but also because of covid and some practical things how has your career kind of changed or or maybe not changed yeah um Let's see, I, I played my final like gig before the lockdown began. Um, I believe that was the second week of, of March. Um, and literally it was a it was a benefit and uh, one of the singers on the show was was Nick Cordero, who of course, you know, passed away like you know, 
a month later I'm like watching TMZ and I see that he, he passed away from COVID. So it just everything uh, has kind of been turned upside down. <laughs> As mm. I'm sure you, you know, I had probably close to 120 shows canceled, mm. like different residencies canceled. Um, so like a very active and, and busy summer of, of touring and I was supposed to re- release a record um, and that was canceled. So, uh, you know, it, it's been a lot of thinking, you know, I think f- for all musicians thinking on our, our feet, um, for me, I, I, you know, dove kind of very he- heavily into like what I could do from home. So like recording from home, like kind of building a studio in the, the spare bedroom of my apartment, you know, um, and, and just trying to make sure I have the, the capability to, to record and uh, track from here. So, you know, I, I dove heavily into music production. Hmm. You know. But it's, at the time I, I produced Dear Blue, I had only been using Logic for like, what, two months or something? Wow. Yeah, so it was like all the time that I normally spend like practicing or writing, I just, I would spend like 12 hours a day watching Logic tutorials and yeah. figuring out how to like program strings and figure out how synths work and wow. Oh, man. <laughs> you know? man, that's really reassuring to hear because, um, you know, we're doing our ensembles virtually right now and we're all using BandLab, you know, so it's a free digital audio workstation that we're using, but it's a pretty steep learning curve, even for something like this, which is fairly intuitive, but, you know, Logic's a fully fleshed out, you know, professional production uh, software program. And, um, you know, it's kind of cool to see that those skills that you would have applied to, say, pra- you know, practicing drums or something like this can also be applied to your new and very much needed skill set of, of audio production, right? You gotta right. do it yourself. Yeah, um, I'm doing a lot of writing. I'm mm. about to orchestrate a show for Broadway. So I'm doing a bunch of, of that kind of stuff as well. Just anything I can, I can do from home. Um, yeah, yeah, and continuing to write and yeah, I look down and like I have the original. <laughs> I'm using it as a coaster right now. It's the <laughs> original like a uh, lead sheet I wrote for Dear Blue. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> this is like uh, yeah. It's probably not use it as a coaster. <laughs> <laughs> you could frame that, put it up there somewhere. You know. Um, so that leads me to a few questions. I was going to ask what you do have coming up next. You said you're working on a Broadway musical, uh, scoring something there. Um, anything else? Any any kind of vision for your career in the future right now maybe you've got like a short-term vision you've got this gig you get like a but like do you see yourself going in a different direction because of the way things happen this year um if anything i'll probably because i've I've gained uh, a few other skill sets i'll probably be more content Mm. um but I, i have an album uh Sorry, I have an album coming out in the uh, in the spring. Um, yeah, I mean, we're like looking forward to like getting back to booking tours and being able to play shows. Um, but this this Broadway show that's opening that's gonna take up a, a good chunk of of my time over the next year and a half. And um, I'm on some other albums that will be out in the in the spring. Um, in 2021, Veronica Swift's uh, album, uh, okay. Okay. Stephen Feithke's Big Band. So looking forward to that as well. And yeah. Good, good. Yeah, it's, you know, man, my heart goes out to all the musicians who are, you know, those who are making their living playing and, um, you know, might not have a teaching gig or something like this to help support, you know, the lack of, of live performances out there. And uh, it's good to see that spirits are still high, you know, we endure <laughs> and we just wait for that moment where we can just figure it out. And people are already, you know, making, you know, ad- adaptations and solutions to this problem and having you know, performances in places they wouldn't have had them before or in ways and in, in, uh, places that they wouldn't have thought of before. So I mean, it was see. already scary, but definitely... Uh... <laughs> definitely got a lot more frightening there for yeah. a minute just like you see, you watch like a year's worth of, of uh, ink on your calendar just completely disappear yeah yeah it's a little spooky right it's a little spooky like, wow how am i gonna eat <laughs> no. well you know um what was interesting and this is just a you know kind of 
off, off topic, I suppose, but um, a friend of mine who's a trumpet player, you might know Augie Haas, um, he released a children's book. And <laughs> so he was like, I don't have any gigs, so I'm, I'm releasing a children's book. I was like, how cool is that? Like, what a cool entrepreneurial kind of, a, you know, it's like we got to, you got to somehow innovate and find a way to keep income coming in, you know, given your talents, given your abilities and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, you got to think on your feet, right? I didn't know Augie wrote a children's book. That's really funny. He just said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he just, te he texted me a picture of him holding it up. It was Augie in his trumpet, little Augie in his trumpet. So it's a, it's a great thing. I might get it for my daughter, um, who's, uh, who's recognizing letters now. And, uh, that's you know, pretty, pretty interesting, but. Um, so again, I, you know, I had you on because of course, you know, I've been a great admirer of yours since knowing you back in, back in high school. I was your student teacher at Sycamore High School. <laughs> at Sycamore High School, my freshman year of high school. Scott Burton's band director. Yeah, that was good times. <laughs> and I always knew you were a killing drummer. And then, uh, you know, having you out as a guest artist and then checking you out online, I see that you do create, a, you put out a lot of content, you know, and so maybe um, just in the last few minutes here, if there are some questions from our panelists, we can always ask those, but I do want to ask about the whole content creation idea, because you said you're going to be creating more. You have a vlog series as well. How did that start? And do you find that that's a really effective way to engage a community and get people kind of funneled into your, um, your, your listening outlets, your music outlets? Um. I started the blog because I was like, wow, we're going to all these different places and having all these different uh, experiences um, and I should document them. <laughs> and that's why the blog started. Um, and in terms of just like engagement, um, I don't I don't know the answer to that still. You know, it, it's funny because I release vlogs and they never do exceptionally well, like they never get like 500,000 views, a million views. Like they, they don't do that. You know, they get a couple thousand views, you know, tops. And I'm like, oh, is this even, this, it takes so much time and so much effort. You have to like walk around everywhere with a camera and yeah, you know, <laughs> everything. And then like editing takes forever. And you know, it's just, it's, it's a hassle. It's fun, but it's a hassle, you know? It's like, oh, should, no one's really watching this. I should stop doing it. And the moment that I stopped doing it, people start messaging me and they're like, where are the vlogs? <laughs> like, okay all right cool you know or, or like we'll we'll be at savannah and like some kids will like run up to me and alfonso and like say a catchphrase and we're just like what <laughs> like, oh, in episode seven i'm like oh okay <laughs> you know? um so yeah i mean I, I i guess it is an outlet because it it, it provides people a, a clear picture of of who you are, at least in that very curated, you know, uh, from that very curated perspective. But it also, it shows people like what it's like to be a young musician mm. on the road, especially like a young jazz musician. I mean, I, I feel like people have no idea <laughs> what, what it's like to just like tour and, and live out of a suitcase and like, are you guys like throwing crazy hotel parties like in 80s movies? And it's like, no one's <laughs> Like all my rock star friends are vegan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to show, um, if that's all right, I'm going to show everybody what we're talking about. Um, this is this is Brian's website, everyone. Uh, he's got a fantastic website, and so you know it's something that we're you know talking about and creating digital portfolios, right? He's got a fantastic website here. One section on education which I really appreciate because, um, you know, being an educator myself, I really believe in this. And you've done some videos for Jazz at Lincoln Center um, talking about what improvisation is, what swing is. And you go around the country and you talk with students as well. And, and some of these experiences end up in your vlogs, right? Your videos. And these are the, some of the clips that we listen to. And then you have your, your video um, log here. Um, how important or significant is education to you in your career? Um, it's extremely important, you know, being the son of educators, one, all, literally my older brother is a chemistry teacher. My younger sister teaches elementary school. You know, um, I think it's always important to, to share experiences with people. Um, and especially for younger musicians, you know, mm -hmm. the way that we, we learn, the way that we play jazz, jazz is an, an oral and an aural music. You know, so being able to to share 
my experiences share what what little knowledge I've I've received from from others is like extremely important to me. Yeah. And you're so good at it too. I just got to say all the clinics I've seen of you working with students, man, you are so good. You're so good, you know, and I, I think it's really important that we do have, um, you know, artists that are just a generation removed from the students in the course is kind of showing, showing the way forward, you know, and show you how you, how you do this and, and you make it successful. Um, you had mentioned <clears throat> just <laughs> cut off at your, your rock star friends. And I know that you've had some really big performances. You were a drummer for the Maya and Marty show. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and NBC show. So to be, I haven't had television in a while, but I started checking out some clips, that, a few clips that I could find online. So this is Maya Rudolph, right? Maya Rudolph and Martin Short, right? A variety show that they did a few years ago for NBC. Um, how did that come about? And was that like a really, was that like a turning point in your career? Did you feel like there was that or any other moment in your career where it was like, man, the, the gigs are starting to roll in. I'm starting to make some connections and, you know, start to meet people in, in the right places. I had just left a band that I was touring with for a while because I wanted to do more like, you know, solo stuff. I really wanted to focus on my own projects and, and writing. Um, and yeah, it was, it kind of came out of nowhere. I just got a phone call, uh, from my friend Charlie Rosen one day and he was like, yeah, we're going to be on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> like, he had no idea what the show was. Um, I don't really think he knew what the show was. He's like, it's a variety show or something. I don't know. We're going to be on TV. <laughs> We're going to 30 Rock. Um, so, yeah. I mean, it, it, it was really cool. That was, like, the most stressful period of my life. I was putting oh, yeah. together a ballroom show. I was putting together, like, a video shoot for, um, for Zildjian uh, for the release of the Avid Assemble just like this massive production. I'm like on the phone ordering techno cranes and like that was crazy in and of itself. And then uh, the show comes about and it's like, I have no idea how to, how to be on television. Like, I don't know how any of this works. Um, and every week you would have a, have a new guest, like Miley Cyrus would show up, Nick Jonas would show up, you know, Tina Fey would be in and it's like, we have to get their music together and it has to be, perfect we only get one take at it so <laughs> yeah. yeah what an experience how fun was that huh yeah, yeah it, was, it was a lot of fun um yeah um you know okay so we're running a little low on time i just want to ask if there are any questions out there i'm not seeing a few there was one early on that said um you know when are you going to be on the west coast <laughs> when are you going to be in california again and i think we all know the answer to that unless you already have uh, something lined up for next year <laughs> I I have no idea when I will be in California again. Um, there's a chance I'll be there in the fall. Uh, we'll see. That's a year from now, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. The future is unknown. Yeah, yeah, future is unknown. And well, it was really great talking to you, Brian. It's great catching up. And thanks for uh, for inviting me to uh, to speak with everyone and having me on. Yeah, of course. You know. I, Here's one, maybe a closing question. All right. I was coming, I was sitting with my wife last night and I was like, what should I ask Brian? What questions? What's your favorite color? You know, those kinds of things. Um, let's see. What, uh, what's the one thing you want people to know about you that they couldn't find through a Google search? Cause you know, they're out there right now. You know, they're out there looking Brian Carter, Brian Carter, Brian Carter. Wow. That's a, uh, that's a good question. Um, what's one thing? or you wish wasn't online, right? Because as we do there's create our of, careers. <laughs> lots of, there's a, there's lots of things I wish weren't online, but uh, we'll get into that. Um, what's one thing that I wish people, huh? Um, I, I really don't, I don't, I really don't know the answer to that. Okay, all right, no problem. I'll let you think about it. How about this? <laughs> this is the, 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 the B closing question then. How about this? Um, is there something that you know now, whether it's a professional bit of information, musical bit of information, we haven't really talked any music technique or anything like that, but there's something you know now that you wish somebody had told you back in high school or college, that you wish a professor had just said, you know, make sure that you do this X, Y, and Z, so on and so forth. Relax. Wow. It's all gonna work out 
great. No one can make or break your career. I feel like we're told the opposite. Right. Like we're we're told like if if you do this, if you mess up, it just takes one phone call and your career is over. And <laughs> you have to be like stressed out if you don't have an ulcer by thirty, then you're not working hard enough. And it's like, <laughs> relax, chill. It's it's honestly gonna work out. That's great. That's great that, advice. That's the honest to God truth. And yeah. I feel like people are always just reinforcing students with the complete opposite. My entire life, I was just like, you should be more stressed out. And I'm like, I'm seven. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Oh, man, that's really fantastic advice. It is because, you know, even as teachers, you find yourself thinking, oh, should I push my students harder? And sometimes the answer is no. Maybe you should relax a little bit and get them to be comfortable. And yeah, and be themselves and be comfortable with themselves and expressing their own ideas and, you know, being comfortable in their own skin, which is something you had mentioned a bit earlier on in the interview. So thank you for that. I think 90% of students need to be pushed in that way. And mm -hmm. I was among the 10% that was just like, I needed a teacher to be like, Brian, it's okay. <laughs> like, he's right. he's, he's <laughs> going to be all right. Yeah. yeah. Great. All right. Well, um, happy holidays to you, Brian. What are you doing for the holidays? Are you going to go back uh, east or are you staying? Um, I'm trying not to give my parents COVID, so I won't be <laughs> I won't be going home. Yeah. Um, I'll be here. I'll probably be writing and yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm in the Christmas spirit. I'm I kind of want to make a Christmas video. I, I might try to put something together really quickly for Christmas. Um, Great, if yeah. not, um, oh, you can check me out. I'm, I'm playing at Smalls on December second. Okay, playing some Christmas music, and I'm gonna put my my Instagram in the chat. Okay, great. So Thank you. If you have any questions and I, I didn't get to it, then just hit me up and I will answer. Yeah, cool. appreciate that, Brian. Thank you so much. Uh, happy holidays to you and your family. Tell your dad hello for me and uh, everyone else back home. Um, I suppose down south now, right? They moved. Yeah, um, Carolina. yeah very cool. So um, for everyone else out there, you can join us again for CRC Music in the studio. Next week, we're not going to do a Friday session because of the holiday. So we have a special session on Tuesday instead. Um, and we have some local musicians, Carlos and Brennan. Um, they are a duo of performers and composers who are speci specializing in chamber music of um, composers of color. So it's going to be a really fantastic event. And they have a whole program for us and uh, really looking forward to that. So hope to see you next Tuesday. And with that, we'll say goodbye. And thanks to Brian and Gabriel Rivera back there doing all the tech help for us. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. All right, have a good one. Take care.